All right, party people. I hope everybody is doing well. It is your boy BQ. We're going to talk some TNA from May 23rd, 2024, an episode that I thought was okay. Uh, probably better than okay, but it wasn't like last week's where last week had some good things going on and then some things that I could really do without. This this was this was a little better. This was a step up. This was um I think the city was Newport, Kentucky, so this is on uh, very close to Cincinnati. Um, and I thought I listened to my guy, Mike, Mike, uh, Gilbert's review on this on his Patreon, and he was really not happy with the crowd and the environment. I actually kind of disagree with him. He, you know, I did, I agree with Mike 90% of the time. I kind of disagree on this one. I thought, I thought they sounded okay. You know, we got the camera view that we don't like that the fans don't like of the entrance. Which means there was what a couple hundred people in there, right? Usually, if they do something like that, but um, I thought they sounded okay. I didn't have any real uh, complaints. I know people were saying the same thing about the Orlando tapings when they went back there, and I was like, I I think they sound fine on TV. So clearly, there's there's a disconnect between me and uh, the people of Twitter on that one, but I think it sounded fine. I mean, uh, I've just gotten used to the fact that. When they film television, there's going to be 200, 250, 300 people there. And I think, you know, since we've done a couple, we, since they have done a couple episodes in Las Vegas, and, you know, you've got a, a pretty decent sized crowd. So even, um, not Snake Eyes, but the, the one after Rebellion, where, you know, there's about 800 people there, you're still talking over double what we normally hear. And I think, I think people might get a little spoiled by that. This is probably the norm. You know, you, you, you're pretty much going to expect 300 people with these shows for, for television tapings, and, and that's fine. So I've just become accustomed to hearing that. I, I've, I've become accustomed to 250, 300, and I'm not really expecting anything else. I want the product to look good. Um, obviously, I want the, the fans to be engaged, but I didn't have a real issue with it. And the other agree, uh, area I have to disagree on is that he was saying that they've tried this venue before and it didn't work. Now, some of you guys might remember TW and myself did an interview with my guy Rich. And this was, I mean, a couple years ago when they did Cincinnati. And he was part of their uh, the, the, the promotion team for this. If you remember, so... I go to that uh, expo in Indianapolis every year. I mean, the place is crazy. It's just filled with people. So Heath and the Good Brothers were there two years ago, and they recommended that TNA work with these guys. Well, my guy Rich was affiliated with them. And if you remember, they, they did a promotional campaign for, for the tapings in Cincinnati, or it might have still been in Kentucky. It was, it was the same general area. And, you know, my guy hit the streets and he did some really good work. You know, he he did let me know that based on his interactions with with TNA that he, he basically confirmed some of our greatest fears in, in regards to their promotion and marketing a lot of the time. You know, he felt that he was what he was bringing, what he was, you know, he says, says this with all due respect. You know, he wasn't talking shit, but... <clears throat> Basically, what he brought to the table in that promotional campaign um, was, was well beyond what they were what they were doing normally by themselves, you know. Um, and I remember those tapings looking and sounding very good. Yeah, there, there being a very good audience there. And I talked about this last week because, you know, I know that they sent some guys to the Cincinnati Reds games, and a lot of fans will say, "Well, okay, well." They went to a major league baseball game, so now the the arena should be packed. Like it just, it really doesn't work like that. These little steps that they make that it's it's brand recognition, brand awareness, which is very very important. But is there a lot of tr crossover between pro baseball and and professional wrestling? You know, like maybe maybe they did move some tickets doing that, but to think that they're going to go to a baseball game and all of a sudden. It's going to blow up. Just, just isn't realistic. But again, brand awareness, brand recognition is very, very important. 
in the long run. Have you ever seen an ad on Facebook or Google or, or just wherever you might see your ads? And maybe it's for a product. Maybe it's for a service. Maybe it's for, for a freaking meal delivery service. And you see the ad three, four, five, six times. And then you're finally like, okay, I think I'll pull the trigger on this. That is how most Americans operate. I, I'm saying Americans because that's where I've, I would say most people, but I'm saying Americans because that's where I've done research in regards to marketing and all that. Um, there, You have to see a brand, you have to see a product several times before you hit that button. It's very rare that you just see this ad pop up for the next big, you know, self-mixing cup design and you're like i'm just gonna buy this right now like you 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 have to see these things over and over and over it's same with commercials too and and i know commercials aren't today what they were 20 years ago 25 years ago but you have to see it over and over and over and that's why brand recognition brand awareness is important and then you might pull that trigger and that that's how that's how these promotional methods are going to be for wrestling too just because they do a minor league ballpark, a major league ballpark, uh, they do radio, they do TV. Like, it doesn't really matter because in, in the short term, it just doesn't matter. What works in the short term is what my guy was doing. Um, my guy, Rich, I'm doing a podcast with him tomorrow, as a matter of fact, where he's really out in the streets and reaching out and touching people and, and, and talking to people directly. That's what moves the needle when you're filling, when you're filling seats. In, in in small small venues you know that's why out here in vegas like there we have some of the most random freaking shows in the world you know what i mean but they get people in there because there's people in the streets daily reaching out and and, and touching people you know i forgot what tagline that was from that that's also dating myself i think it was like at&t or someone Re reach out and, or something reach out and touch someone I think that's what it was back like in the 90s um but that that's how you put butts in seats for these smaller venues like it, it really takes like the guerrilla marketing tactics when you're doing these you know i'm trying to encompass all these things at once and and uh try to kill five birds with one stone like it, it just doesn't work like that but it but it will um it will take that first step in making a brand recognizable to someone and then maybe Next time they're in Cincinnati, they'll be like, you know what? I remember, I remember this program. Or maybe six months from now, they come across the show on TV. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll check this out. I, I remember they were at the baseball game. Like that's how that shit works. So you're just not going to see short-term game games from those type of things. You know, that just that just uh, the reality. Uh, man, before we get into this episode, um, they've released a couple DVDs. Eli Drake and Drew Galloway. And if you know anything about me, you know that I, I rolled my eyes at these immediately. I mean, these two guys are hot in WWE right now, so they said, let's capitalize off this shit. Man, what are they going to do with Eli Drake? What? As, us as fans knew that he had all this potential and we wanted to see him at the top, but did they ever come close to putting him there? Yeah, they put that ugly Global Force Wrestling title with the Impact nameplate on it. That was the worst era of Impact Wrestling slash TNA in the freaking history of the company. And they never treated him like a main eventer. They they had him job out to Austin Aries in, in under a minute uh, because Austin Aries came from WWE, so let's put the fucking title on this guy. I mean... How ridiculous in retrospect does that look to hit your wagon on Austin Aries instead of Eli Drake? He had the tag, you know, a King of the Mountain title run, which was okay. A, a tag team title run with Scott Steiner that no one, no one asked for. His his career can be summed up in in us hardcore fans seeing the potential in him, rather than how they actually used him and how they actually pushed him. You know, and it, it just, it, man, it's it just such a step backwards. Like you look at their, their social media posts and, and the marks are in there. So, oh, you know, thank you for releasing this. 
But then the people who who want to see actual growth within this company, and and I don't just see I don't just mean growth from a standpoint of viewership and butts and seats, but like a mentality growth too. Like when 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 are you going to make our guys special? The guys that we're watching and the g- girls we're watching from week to week, you know, when are we going to get them to that point? They wouldn't have released this Eli Drake DVD if he wasn't LA Knight in WWE right now, right? Like this is done strictly to try to capitalize off it. Same with with, with Drew Galloway. Granted, he did have a world title run, but you know they did the rising thing for a while. So I I, I do got to give them respect because when Drew Galloway came over, they didn't like hot shot him to the world title like they would now. They actually kind of played the long game with him. But they did the rising thing, and then he he you know he eventually wins a world title, and it was one of the most obvious things in the world. They did feast or fired, you know it was like him, Grado, Bobby Roode, and Eli Drake. I mean, you knew exactly where the titles were going. You you know every time you know who's getting fired, you know who's getting the title shots. It's it's just real real freaking obvious. So he gets the title shot. He eventually cashes in. He has a decent run. Like he's a little we probably look back at it more fondly than how we looked at it when he was the champion. He, he, you know, came off a little bland, um, you know, at the time, like everyone's from the UK now, everyone's got an accent now, but at the time, like that wasn't putting a dude with an accent as your top guy was, was not really a thing. So it was something very different. I don't even remember how he lost the title ultimately. I don't have a, a freaking clue, but I know after that he was in the grand championship tournament. What are you going to do on this DVD? So his grand championship matches, like he really only had one solid year of shit to really write home about. So I just, I don't know what the hell you're putting on these DVDs. And may, maybe you guys tell me, oh, well, yeah, there's this match, there's that match. I remember. Matt Hardy, Drew Galloway, and man, who was in the, uh, I don't think it was EC3. Yeah, I guess EC3 was probably in the match. Bound for Glory, they did a three-way. Like, I thought that was pretty good. I don't think he won the match. I'm pretty sure EC3 won. Or No, I think that's the match maybe Drew won, and then Matt Hardy got it thrown out or something. But I'm just saying, man, like, you're just piecing together shit here, and it makes you look desperate. So um, many, many of you maybe dis- may you know may disagree with that, and that, that's fine if you think so. But um, if you're on the outside looking in, let's just say you're a WWE fan, just be realistic. If you're a WWE fan and you come across TNA has released these two DVDs and they released them together, are you more likely to say, "Let me get this DVD," or are you most likely to say, "What a desperation move"? I mean, what do you really think someone who doesn't watch TNA is thinking when they see that? So if you want to appease the people who already watch the product, uh, go for it, you know, but, but it's, it's a growth mentality that I'm looking for. And this is like a huge step. This is like Dixie Carter shit. Um, it's just a huge step back in my opinion. You may disagree. That's fine. Um, so let's get into this episode here. As I said, it was okay. It was decent. Uh, I think I was entertained enough. You know, there was, there was nothing where I'm watching and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Of course, there's some stuff that I I didn't agree with necessarily, but I I don't think I, there was nothing that I hated. Like last week's episode had stuff where I was just like, this is bad. You know, it wasn't really like that this week. Uh, I took some really sloppy notes for this episode, so bear with me if I'm pausing a little bit to try to decipher my chicken scratch. I have horrible handwriting. Um, I grew up a very good artist. I could draw, I could paint. But usually when you have the, that kind of talent and skill, you cannot print. It's 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 almost like you treat everything like you're sketching. And it's I can't even read my writing most of the time. Usually I try to be in a position where I take notes typing them out. But when I have to write them, it's pretty, it's pretty embarrassing. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to say was, I've said this a couple of times over the last couple of months, Jade is sounding much better doing the ring announcing. If you go back to those episodes of BTI that she was doing and what she's doing now, there's a lot of improvement. There's improvement very, very quickly. So 
I was optimistic about that when they hired her to fill the role. Like I knew she wasn't ready, but you know, Gia Miller was not ready once upon a time. Mackenzie Mitchell, I'm talking about backstage stuff. Mackenzie Mitchell was not ready behind, you know, once upon a time. They were awful, as a matter of fact, both of them. And they're, you know, they ended up being pretty good. So I thought Jade was further along as a ring announcer as Gia Miller was as a backstage interviewer. Like if you're talking when they started. And she's get, she's getting pretty good now. And they're they're keeping her on screen, showing her on screen a little bit more. Man, something is making my eye blurry. I don't know what the hell it, hell it is. Okay, there we go. Um, you know they're showing her on screen, and it's looking a little more professional. So, uh, but but I think she's doing a, an excellent job. Um, and this kicks off with you know Tom Hannafin yelling at us for two minutes before they play. We own the night. I'm just kidding. Uh, cross the line. And then we get the opening match. It's it's Nick Nemeth and Broken Map versus uh, the system. And, you know, this was uh, this was announced a while ago. And for those who just like were really unhappy with the with how many people were in the crowd. They've had this strategy going for maybe two years where they announce the entire card of the tapings, not the card, but just every single match of the tapings well in advance. And I, I think when you do that, and I've I've got into these arguments with people on Twitter, and they said, "Well, you know, they're promoting." Okay, cool. But that's no different than like AEW just giving you random matches. If you're just showing matches, match cards, like, "Hey, come watch these two people fight, or these two teams fight," and there's no context behind it, it just looks like fucking wrestling. You know what I'm saying? Like. It, you're, the analogy I used before is that you're you're showing us chapter five. We, we, you know, you're asking us to read chapter five before we can read chapter one. You know, like some of the matches that they advertise, like there's there's kind of some story behind it, and we're just knowing we're getting the matches in advance. So when you take the matches at face value, you know, Trent Seven versus this person and Nick. You know Ryan Nemeth versus this person. I think I might have said Nick Nemeth when I I mentioned this match. I meant to say Ryan Nemeth if I misspoke. I don't know that people necessarily care, but if you you put a little bit of like context behind in a story, maybe maybe you know what I'm saying. I think there's just more interest. But this is a strategy they've been trying to use. We're going to tell you all the matches in advance on social media, and I don't even think that's necessary because if you're just trying to to this Kentucky Cincinnati market, then run targeted ads and then you can show those matches if you want. If you really are like stuck on that strategy, but don't give it away on social media to everyone else too. I still think just doing it to the targeted audience is still a bad move because you're you're telling them, hey, here's just some wrestling matches. Do you want to come watch these wrestling matches? You know, I, I think you you know you find your one or two matches that you want to push and announce those. You know, and then find some other creative way to get people interested, you know. But I just don't think the people in the Cincinnati area cared for what they were being shown. But yeah, this was Ryan Nemeth, who has a horrible theme song. Like, you can tell the wrestlers that they they actually care about uh, coming out, coming off like stars. And the ones were just like, hey, we just, here's a, a stock song for you. Like, here's here's a... You know, we don't even own the rights to this MP3, but here's here's this. You're gonna come out to this. You know, even Mike Bailey's song at the end, I was like, man, it sounds like Josh Alexander's song, and I don't like that song either. You know, um, but yeah, Ryan Nemeth's song is awful, and which is crazy because you got Nick Nemeth who has, has this great song, and then you got his brother that, you know, and and again, you're kicking off with Ryan Nemeth. I don't have an issue with the dude, but it's like he's never had any real reps on tv you know he's been he's always been presented as a joke as a jobber like if this if you want to give this guy an opportunity cool but um right now there's not a he doesn't have a lot of name value and it seems like they're they're pushing you know when they're promoting the tickets hey we got ryan nemeth here so anyway he um he teams up with broken matt and um 
the system loses two weeks in a row. So Brian Myers has been pinned two weeks in a row right after they had all this momentum where these guys could not lose. Like you could not beat the system no matter what the freaking match was. You know, the very beginning, they lost two out of the first three matches and then they won, went on an incredible win streak. And now they're on a losing streak. And uh, Ryan Nemeth pins one half of the tag team champions with a cross body block off the top rope. Flying body press, whatever you want to call it. I was expecting Tom Hannafin to hit us with that I kick out. I, I, that, I, was like, I was waiting for it. And instead, we got a three count. So if that's his finisher, I'm going to go back to what I say all the time. Where are the cool moves in TNA? All right. Where are the cool finishers? I really hope. That is not his finisher. What is he fucking Shane Douglas from 1991? Like, what the hell? Um, so anyway, after this, there's, um, you know, Moose comes down. He spears Broken Matt. And then Nick Nemeth comes out because he shows up for one set of tapings every single time. He shows up, for, I mean, not for one set of tapings, the first day of tapings, and then he leaves. So he has to come and, and you know, do his part. And he comes and saves him. And we haven't seen him on TV in a little bit. And the storyline makes sense. It's not random. The storyline makes sense. But here's my issue with it. they These against all odds title shots, they're almost pushing. Not pushing. Um, they're almost building these matches. And I say building because that makes it sound like it's a long-term story. They're putting together these matches the same way they did for Rebellion. It's... You know, when 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 Speedball Mountain, Cheeseball Fountain got their title shot, when Nick Nemeth got his title shot, it's because the system runs out and they do a run in and they they're granted title shots. A, a, a criticism that Eric Bischoff has about AEW all the time is that there's no stories. There's excuses for matches. And we're getting to that territory with TNA excuses for matches. After. The match is over. They're talking to Santino backstage. And Santino, and, and he said, uh, you pin the champs, you get a tag team title shot. Matt Hardy says, I didn't come here to be a tag team champion. I came here to pro- procure the title of the world from the man known as Moose or whatever the hell. So Santino, you know, like the benevolent man he is, grants Matt Hardy a title shot. Matt Hardy has not won one match since joining this company. He's never won a singles match. He's, he's, you know, he said, well, you were on the winning side of the champions challenge. Okay. Then if that's the case, is Steph DeLander going to wrestle for the fucking title again? Is who else was in this shit? Like is Eric Young going to wrestle the freaking Laredo kid? Like get... Matt didn't even get the, the win in that match. Joe Hendry did. You know, so, I, you know, I was saying it. Mike Gilbert was saying it. We knew that come against all odds, Matt, Broken Matt was going to wrestle for the title. We knew that this was happening. But we're, we were saying, how do we get there? Because he's not doing anything to earn a title shot. But he's, he's granted it here. He didn't even get the pin in this match. I mean, it's, it's – so, again, it's excuses for matches. That's what they're doing. That being said, I would rather they do have excuses for matches for the TNA Plus shows. If you're going to put some effort into a story, do it for Slammiversary. So, you know, playing devil's advocate, if that's how they want to do, you know, what they call their premium live event. I don't even know. What is a premium live event? Is it every pay-per-view? I don't even know. I don't care. The TNA Plus shows. If that's how they want to do it, they want to make excuses for matches, cool. I just don't think you have they, they they have kept this mentality that every title has to be on the line. And you know, then he awards the Nemeth brothers a title shot. When I did my live stream a couple days ago, I was so adamant that the Nemeth brothers I, I know I actually predicted this on one of my podcasts about maybe three weeks ago, the Nemeth brothers versus the system at Slammiversary. On my live stream, I was very adamant about this. Because this can be one of the money drawing matches on your card. I know that Ryan Nemeth means nothing, but the sum of the two parts of the Nemeth brothers 
teaming together for the first time means something. And of course, teaming together for the first time, they get an immediate title shot. But um, I think the I, I, man, I just I'm I'm a little disappointed. I really thought it was, it was slam. I thought it was just obvious that it was going to be a slam anniversary. I knew for a fact in my head this was not going to be on TNA Plus. And Tom Hannafin, who's back to his first time ever matchup shit, he I mean he pointed this out that these guys had never teamed together before. So the first time ever or ordeal. So uh, you know we're definitely getting throwaway title matches on against all odds. So they probably feel like hey we got to have one legitimate title match, but um. I know that I'm. I don't. I'm not trying to fantasy book here. I hate doing that. But what I'm always looking for in these TNA Plus shows, why not just just get outside the box for a little bit and be like, hey, Alicia and Eddie Edwards are going to have a mixed tag team match versus Ryan Nemeth and uh, fucking Jody Thread, and then then do a second mixed one. It's uh, Brian Myers and Masha versus. Uh, who's his partner? Oh, okay, Nick Nemeth and who's, uh, Danny Luna. You know what I'm saying? Like, just switch shit up a little bit. Don't feel the pressure to defend every title every single time because the titles rarely change hands on these input TNA Plus shows. So I would just like to see him find a way to be more creative for these shows so they're not just like B-level pay-per-views. Like, find, just do something to where the match structure is different or there's some kind of stakes, you know, like, I, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just have an issue with this match. And who who the fuck am I, right? I'm just I'm just a dude. I'm just a a podcaster. Someone asked me on the live stream, would I accept a job from TNA? And I and I want to be very clear in this. I don't think I possess anything that a wrestling company is looking for. That isn't. I mean, I have some of the skills. Don't get me wrong. But I'm even though I share some of my marketing is insight with you and you guys see that I'm a pretty decent graphic designer and um, I've given some insight about lighting and then post-production. I am of, of, a, of a novice level in comparison to what wrestling companies should be signing or should be hiring. I don't, I, I just want to make it clear that I don't think that I'm a, I offer something that a wrestling company would want. I have, thought about trying to get in with the graphic design, the graphic departments at NWA, because I think I'm better than what they have. But I don't think I'm better than the graphics TNA does. Um, I think I probably, I, I th I'm pretty sure I have a little more knowledge in post-production type of shit, because clearly I'm pointing out the issues with it, but uh, I am I am of intern level experience. Okay, so I'm just putting that out there that I acknowledge that I don't think that I should work for the company. Plus I, I could not accept intern level pay. If I'm being honest with you, I have a family of six. I'm 45. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just not a thing I can do. Um, but I would do like graphic design work remotely for NWA if I could. Um, yeah. So th these TNA plus shows, cause I, I just, I just, at the risk of not sounding like I contradict myself, I don't want them. I don't want the shows to mean nothing, but I don't want them to go too hard. I want. I just want something in the middle, and uh, yeah, and that's that. You know, like Broken Matt versus Moose. That's probably something in the middle. No, everyone knows Broken Matt's not going to win. Allison K is probably going to wrestle for the knockouts title. Like that's fine. We know she's not going to win. You know, so I, I just, I don't want it to be like pointless, but I don't want it to be pay-per-view level you know like I, I think it should just be a step above a tna impact episode gm miller was backstage with the abc and i always point out the flaws in this every week this looked 70 percent better there's still some shadows and stuff but it's not like gm miller does not look like roddy piper at wrestlemania versus bad news brown where he's half white half black you know it's they still like could use some work, but as far as do they look professional now? It looks professional, you know. So I, I thought it was a big step up. I'm not going to say it's 100 percent better. That's 70 percent better. It's a, it's a huge, huge, huge step up, and I, th I thought this looked a lot more professional. And then um, 
man, let me look at these other notes because I'm writing something. Uh, what I wrote in my notes here doesn't make sense. Oh, no, it's just that I, I got these. I got it backwards. That's all it was. The uh, Gia Miller segment with the ABC and then Santino talking to Matt and Ryan Nemeth. So. So, yeah, Broken Matt. Um, and this is something I've been saying about Broken Matt, too, is that bro- the money in Broken Matt was not him wrestling. And this dude's wrestling every week. We're not seeing any of what made that character fun and interesting and and got eyeballs on the company like we're not seeing any of that and and perhaps we will but right now we're not okay after this we got the rascals versus jobber and taint um this was a team of one dude was travis williams i don't even remember what the other dude's name was his twitter is Judas Sakaris, Judas Sakaris, maybe. I'm looking at his handle. It's all one word, so I, I don't know. These guys had some talent. You know, this was like a glorified squash match, you know. Um, no clue if this is a team that we're gonna see stick around. Probably not, but anything is possible. I thought they had some off some very unique offense. You know, this wasn't a, that's, that's why I said it was a glorified squash. It was they they showed they showed some offense that was very interesting. They they don't physically look like anything that I really care to see on my TV anymore. By that I just mean let me not sound too disrespectful. Like they just look they just look like a couple dudes. You know what I mean? Like I I, I don't there's no I don't see anything like star potential in their look uh, when I look at them. But maybe they stick around. Um, the real name is Sinner and Saints, which actually I think is a great tag team name. But until they win shows on this episode, on this uh, until they win matches on this show, they will be Jobber and Taint. Steve Macklin hits the ring after the match and attacks the Rascals, and then he goes backstage and Gia Miller stops him. And you know, was this payback? Like, of course, it was payback. And then Mike Santana walks up. We're gonna fast forward all this shit. Fast, Mike Santana challenges for next week. Let's let's just fast forward right now. This is exactly what the fuck is going to happen. I, I would, of course, I could be wrong. I'm about ninety nine percent sure I'm not. Mike Santana is going to wrestle Steve Macklin. The match is going to be a great match for about eight minutes. The Rascals are going to come down. It's going to be a no contest, and then they're going to set up a tag team match for Against All Odds. Not for Slammiversary, for Against All Odds. Not going to do any kind of long term story. It's going to be an against all odds tag team match: the Rascals versus Mike Santana and Steve Macklin. So let's just fat, f- cut to the fucking chase here. And then it shows this is a little random. Frankie Kazarian is cornering Jay Chung. Um, Right away, I tuned out because this motherfucker is wearing purple and gold because he's from Southern California, and I don't fuck with anything Lakers. Um, he's he's he, but he's berating her, and he's been doing this for a while. You know, call me the king of TNA. This is why I was upset. This was one of the reasons I was upset that Josh Alexander and him had this impromptu match in their clothes, which was a number one contendership match. When I want to see some kind of program between these guys. We've seen them wrestle once before. They wrestled for 45 minutes. I didn't watch it because I don't watch long wrestling matches like that. But they were both baby faces. This is a different version of Frankie Kazarian. This could have been, you know, this could have been, Josh is hurt right now. So this could have been like their version of what Drew Galloway is doing with CM Punk right now. You know, like this, this really... They could have done something with this, but they immediately gave us the match. And it was a competitive match. It wasn't like, uh, you know, they wrestled for five minutes and someone broke it up. You know, they actually wrestled the match in their clothes. Like, I was just befumbled that this happened. So now he's berating Jay Chung on the, on the outside. And what have I been saying this, saying for years? TNA has a crutch. There's P, the PCO crutch, and there's the wife crutch. When you need to try to make someone interesting, 
you bring in the wife. And they've already done this with Josh three times. They had Moose spear her one time. They had Moose, you know, uh, cash in on Josh in front of her. And they had Bully Ray do something to her on the outside. I don't I don't fully remember, um, but it, but it's a crutch. They did it did it for Eddie Edwards multiple times. They did it for Johnny Impact. They did it for Brian Cage. And they've done it for Josh Alexander. And they're going back to that well once again, where when once she became an on-screen character, even though that she's obviously on TV from week to week, to where it makes it easy to do this, I actually thought they were going to separate the two of them. I didn't think they were going to go back to, you know, let's let's attack Jade Chung. Um, and that looks like that's where they're going. And we're just going to get this all over again. And I'm I'm really confused with the booking of Josh Alexander right now. The And I'm not saying it's because they're doing something wrong. It's because he got hurt. But and then he wins the random number one contendership matchup, which was very unnecessary. And I and when I say unnecessary, like it's just not time for him to wrestle for the title again. That's 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 my point. Um, and now they're doing this. Like I don't I don't. It, it's really weird what they're doing. Right now, the company is hurting without having Josh on screen because he still is the top guy. It's not good. I think it's good to have breaks from Josh personally, but I think it is hurting the company a little bit. And you don't have Hammerstone on screen either. Speaking of Hammerstone, I have, I'm a little concerned come Slam Reversary. So they ran um, a little ad saying, hey, we're going to be at Cicero, Cicero Stadium and then the 3200 Arena, whatever number it is in, in, in uh, Philadelphia. They feel the need to constantly go back there. And when they do, it's the same formula. It's Tommy Dreamer, it's Rhino, it's garbage matches. And I've said a couple times now, I don't know that there's any data to support that the current residents of Philadelphia want to see ECW style matches with ECW wrestlers. You know, I, I wish I had a better analogy for, or for that people could relate to, but I just, I don't think they care. I really don't. But here's my concern with Slammiversary. I think that's the last location they're doing before Slammiversary. I have big time concern that Tommy Dreamer is going to do an angle with Hammerstone. I don't know when Hammerstone's going to be back. But if you remember weeks ago when they did the same arena, which Tommy Dreamer says the best arena in the world, not Madison Square Garden, not Barclays Center, not Crypto.com Arena, not the Intuit Dome, not Boston Gardens, not this 3200 Arena. Um, and again, I might have those the name of the arena wrong. I don't care. If you remember, they had an angle where Tommy Dreamer almost came out as an authority figure. He looked awful. Hammerstone picks him up, and it looks like he is... You know, to give him the torture rack, it looked like he was carrying a body pillow full of chocolate pudding. It was one of the worst visuals ever on this TV show. And they haven't done anything to blow it off since. And maybe it's because Alexander or, uh, Hammerstone is hurt. But I've got a I've got a bad feeling that we're getting some kind of Tommy Dreamer versus Hammerstone garbage match either at the show in Philadelphia or they're going to build an angle for slam reversary. I'm I'm very worried about that. Or or, or Rhino does comes steps out for him. I I don't know. Maybe it's Tommy Dreamer and Rhino like I man I I might just be fantasy booking too much in my head, but I hope they don't go that direction. So, we're a couple matches through this show and when you had Ryan Nemeth and Broken Matt versus the system. There was a post-match beatdown angle. Then we got the Rascals versus uh, 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 Jobber and Taint. Couldn't remember their names. Post-match beatdown angle. Now, this, met, this next match did not have that. 
No, it's sort. It, it, it still. Uh, no, nah, no, nah, it didn't. But then the match after it did. So th- this is a formula that, that they're now doing the AEW formula of let's have a post match beatdown angle, as in what an excuse for a match. But before we get to that, Cody Deaner came down. Um, I'm going to come up with a, a name for Cody here soon. I, I don't know what it is. Um. But he he comes out and he calls out Jake something, a.k.a. Jake put on something, anything, a.k.a. Jake, let me slip into something a little more comfortable. He comes out dressed to compete as he always is. And they're dragging this out a little bit. Jake is going to turn on him. Uh, but, but they're dragging it out. Cody Diener is a jobber. He's not over. This is a good... Uh, Storyline wise, this is a good first opponent for Jake when this eventual heel turn happens because I I think it's pretty obvious it is. Uh, but then the good the the bad hands come out and they cut a little promo. I thought John Schuyler did a good job, and then they have a match. It is called a KFC match. Santino comes out and he said it is a Kentucky Fight Club match. He's going with KFC like Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm all for an authority figure on the show, and I do think Santino, his character, while it's very well past him, his prime, he's way past his prime. Don't get me fucking wrong. And but but I do find him funny. Like this goof character that comes out making these matches all the time. I think it's starting to run its course. So the so Cody Deaner and Jake, let me slip into something more comfortable, take on the bad hands. And um, we know how this is going to fucking end. I thought it was going to be a garbage match, and it actually wasn't. So I don't know why it was a KFC match, but whatever. And then they shook hands after the match. Um, and then Jordan Grace is backstage. She said she lost in the champion's challenge, and now she asks for a new opponent. Well, you might as well have given her Steph to land her. She was on the winning end, right? And then <laughs> the system was backstage. So they're shooting these backstage angles very different right now. They're, they come off cinematic, and they look good. They're, they're professional. But for whatever reason, the camera is up in their face. And it, and. I've been asking for them to kind of return to the backstage shaky cam shit they did in TNA. And this is close to that. It's it's definitely close to that. But why are the cameras up in their face? That, have to, that has to mean a cameraman is actually up in their face when they're trying to talk to each other. The magic before with TNA was that it was almost like the cameraman would kind of sneak up on him. You know, they... St- Right now, the backstage segments are always like very, very scripted. It's like, okay, there's a cameraman, hit the record button, and then we start our conversation. And there's nothing natural about it. It always looks like the cameraman just happens to be there when they have a conversation. Before, it almost looked like, hey, two wrestlers were talking, they were having a conversation, and the cameraman would kind of was walking around and look, you know, kind of sneak up on him and and, and kind of listen, like. That's a little closer to what this is, but but then when you start shoving the camera in their face, like Alicia started talking and her freaking whole face took up the camera. I was like, what what are they doing? But this <laughs> they have one camera angle that looks fine. And then they go to the second camera angle and it's glitching and it's bouncing around. And at first I said, okay, it's my internet, it's my YouTube, it's my phone. And then every time they went to that angle, it was the same glitching. Why did they air this? Why was it glitching to begin with? What fucking equipment are we using? And if it happens in post-production, then fix it. I don't think it was the raw. I can't imagine in this day and age, it was the raw recording. You're not using a fucking VHS tape. I don't think it was the raw video recording of the segment. You know, if, if you guys, for those of you who might be a little older and you're recording on VHS tape and sometimes that VHS tape wasn't of the best quality or you've been using it for a really long time recording over yourself, you know, sometimes 
the the VA, the, you know, the 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 ribbon gets you know worn out a little bit, and then you get the, the you know the glitches and the like. That's what this looked. This was fucking horrible. And I'm really hoping this wasn't done on purpose. But at least they're planting the seeds to Joe Hendry. He walks up and the content of this was good because the system was like, hey, you're a joke. Eddie Edwards was saying, you're a joke, dude. You know, and that's how it should come off. It should come off like, hey, Joe Hendry is getting all this buzz, but you're a comedy dude. So don't talk to us. You know, that that's how this should start. And then it can, you know, kind of snowball from there. So I guess they felt that it was an appropriate segment. But, dude, would WWE have put this on their fucking TV? I mean, this this was horrible. This was embarrassing, is what it was. And anyone who justifies it, you're just, you're, I'm not trying to talk shit about my own viewers and listeners, but I, I'm just saying, like, you're part of the problem. And 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 that that's who TNA is, unfortunately, a lot of the time trying to appease is the people who will justify this. Oh, it's fine. It's just, it's just TV. It's just one segment. You know, those who will come up with the excuses. That's who they're appeasing, and that's what that's what's going to hurt their growth. So Jordan Grace takes on Marty Bell here. I talked about this on the live stream um, because I talked to Marty and, and AK a month month and a half ago or so. And I asked them if we would see him on TV anytime soon. And uh, they both appear to give me a very genuine answer that they weren't under the, you know, I was under the impression they they didn't have any plans to be on TV. So either they really worked me to my face very good um, or this just kind of came together. I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that I, um, I hope that they're signed with the company. It's, you know, my favorite, two of my favorite, um, women's wrestlers in the world, especially as a tag team. But I said this on the live stream. Marty Bell lives in Cincinnati. She told me her boyfriend wrestles, I believe, for EC3's uh, Exodus Pro. And he lives there. And, and, she, and, and so she moved out there. Allison, these two are together all the time. Allison lives in Michigan, and they're always visiting each other. Like, these are best friends in every in any definition of the word these two are best friends they're extremely close they're always together even though they live separately uh in separate states they are together all the time usually where one goes the other seems to follow in one way shape or form like you're not going to get uh one without the other so she lives in cincinnati she absolutely loves it there and I, w- I was saying on my live stream that I think Ohio is a uh, actually it, it gets a really bad rap, especially in the in the sports world. But I've always felt Ohio is kind of a hidden gem. But I love that part of the country. I didn't move to Las Vegas for a quality of life, <laughs> as as cool as it is living here and it's fun and there's a lot going on. I was very content living in the Midwest. I, it was my wife who wanted to be closer to home, but I I never had interest in being close to home. I never had interest in moving back to California. Um, I love living in the Midwest. So I've been to all those states, Indianapolis, Ohio, you know, those general areas, and I, I love visiting those areas. You know, so she says she really likes it out there. Um, but I'm just saying prepare for the fact that she just did this booking because she was she's from the area. Because they do this all the time, right? They just grab locals. Um, Allison K always travels with her. And if against all odds is in Chicago, like that's not really that far from Michigan. She's probably wrestling Allison K at, uh, when I say she, Jordan Grace, who won this match fairly quickly against Marty Bell. She's most likely Jordan Grace wrestling Allison K at against all odds. It's another throwaway match. The match is for. Ash by elegance to wrestle at slam anniversary. Like that's the match right there. That's what we're getting. There have been building this for a really long time. So I, I kind of have a hard time believing that number one contender, Marty bell and, uh, Allison K 
are going to both lose to Jordan Grace and then remain in the company. I, I have a hard time believing that, but I hope that they do. I, I would love for them to stick around. I've been waiting them for be a, for them to be a fixture on my television for a long time. So I really hope that is the case, but I'm just trying to prepare you guys that Marty Bell lives in Cincinnati. She was mo- most likely took a booking and then they found that there was an opportunity for them to bring Allison Kay in who attacked Jordan and Grace after the match. So we have three post-match fucking angles um, for excuses for matches. And um, most likely we're getting that at against all odds. And then she's going to beat them both. And then we're going to move on to Ash by Elegance. This whole match, um, Iceman, the personal concierge, had like a, a mannequin of Ash. So it showed a picture of Ash by Elegance. That she got one of her veneers knocked out. I had to laugh because I have veneers. What? No, I used to have veneers, uh, but they got knocked out quite a bit. And <laughs> I remember I would have to go to work like that. Um, I eventually would buy like denture cream and, and uh, kind of glue my teeth back on, which was really uncomfortable. But I just rather than look like Ash looked in that picture, I would just do that. But I've since got crowns. So now, you know, now I'm nice and beautiful in the teeth. Um, this is the second time they've used like a dental angle with Ash. And I do have a concern. I, I said this last week, probably the week before. I have a concern they're going too much comedy with Ash. And I think that's a huge mistake. Now, Iceman's funny. He. I, ju- I think it was a little too much here. I think it was a little too much, but I'm not going to lie and say it wasn't entertaining because I, I think he was entertaining here. But but yeah, Jordan runs through Marty Bell pretty quickly. Post-match angle, just like in the first couple matches of the episode, excuse for a match. We're probably going to announce Allison K versus Jordan Grace next week, which is interesting. That should be good. That should be fun. And then we get Santino backstage calling Jonathan Gresham, trying to find out where he is. Because it's not like Jonathan Gresham doesn't work for the fucking company and probably has to let them know where he is during TV tapings. Um, He wanted to know about the black substance. Everyone's getting sick. And he lets them know that uh, the referees are going to wear masks and gloves going forward. And he's going to be facing Salami Calorie Ham, the bread machine. And we'll see where that goes. They were taking a pretty cool thing with Jonathan Gresham and getting a little silly with it. Tasha Steeles then takes on Jobby Threat with Danny Luza and Lars Fredrickson. So you guys remember what I told you and what was told to me is that there's going to be a lot of use of public figures on these shows. And I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning. It does not mean we're going to get huge bumps in viewership. It is for the sake of legitimacy brand awareness because these guys are tweeting they're you know what i'm saying like they're they're talking about this shit on social media it's about brand awareness and just looking legit the large Fredrickson's fans of the world are not tuning into tna wrestling because he sends out a tweet just you know the marks need to calm down so tasha steels makes her bi-monthly appearance and she hits the the cutter on jobby threat for the victory I've said this on my NWA review because their top girl, Kenzie Cut- Kenzie Page, uses the cutter. If any wrestler out there, female, male, wants to get to the next level, take the next step in their career, they and, and, they, and the cutter is their finisher, they need to get rid of the cutter and find a different finisher because the cutter is played out. It's the super kick. You're never going to be Randy Orton. You're never going to be Diamond Dallas Page. So anything, pretty much anyone else using that move is going to look like shit in comparison. So if you want to, if, if, like, if Tasha Steeles wants to get to the next level, she needs a better finisher. But she beats Jobby Threat, and they're they're like, they're telling this story that they're trying to go back to basics, which these team never beat anybody. They won the tag team championship, lost them very quickly. They won them in a very fluke manner. 
and then they lost them pretty quickly. Like the, the, these girls lose more often than they win. Like what? If, what? Are, what are basics? What is square one here? But at least they're they're trying to tell like a little bit of a story to get to make them interesting, so it's not that big of a deal. I, I'm just saying on 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 the surface, I don't know how much sense it makes. It's not like they're going back to, you know, uh, two years ago when they were running through the division. You know, they've been a team for a handful of months. <clears throat> I think they they got together in 2024, so we're only not even halfway through the year. Speaking of 2024, I was looking at the uh, the Champions Challenge, like the the, uh, the team of all stars. I don't think that team has won a collective six matches in 2024. It's just that just made me laugh. I was like, why are these guys all stars? And then we get a PCO vignette. Last week when he gave the rose to Steph Delander, I didn't hate it. And I said, if it'll get us away from PCO walking around backstage and yelling people's names, then I'm all for it. And then we just get PCO yelling Steph's name over and over and over. AJ Francis and Rich Swan are backstage saying they're scouting the Champions Challenge because, again, you can be on the winning side of the Champions Challenge and get a title match, or you could be on the winning side side of the challenge and get nothing because nothing makes sense for title matches and contenders. You know, you got the number one contender, Marty Bell on this episode. They said they're going to basically challenge for mystery title next week. But the problem is once again, they have let us know all the matches in advance. We know that AJ Francis is going to wrestle Laredo kid and it'll be the second shortest title reign of 2024 behind Actually, it might be the third. The shortest was um, MK Ultra, and I can't imagine that Jobby Threat and Danny Luza were that much longer. I don't, I don't know. We'll see, but it's definitely top three <coughs> shortest title reigns. It's definitely the most meaningless title reign. I mean, my fucking god. I I know I already mentioned this before, but. Laredo Kid beats Crazy Steve on the pre-show, I think it was. And he lays the title down like he just won the fucking Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania. He looked like he was Cody Rhodes finishing his story. Like, finally, this motherfucker laid down the Digital Media Championship and look, appeared to be in tears under his mask. I would be in tears, like sad tears, if they gave me that title. And then the main event of this program was uh, the number one contendership for Mustafa Ali's X Division Championship. So it's not anyone in the Champions Challenge. It's uh, Trent. I'll have a number seven with extra fries, a Coke, and a pie. One of those delicious pies versus cheese ball, Mike Bailey. Um, Trent Seven looks like one of those dudes. Like if someone brought a box of donuts to work, he'd be like, mm, "Don't mind if I do." Uh, this was okay. I, you guys probably like this more than I do, uh, more than I did. I thought it was long. I thought it was kind of boring. You know, like they're doing the AEW chop spots. They did it two or three times in this match, where you stand in front of one another and let each other chop each other back and forth. It's pretty much like a every AEW match at this point. A lot of fuckery in this, you know. Like God forbid that this in an episode with with nothing but post match angles. Now they're doing you know post match beatdowns. They are doing, uh, you know, an an in match angle to where Mustafa Ali comes down. Uh, with his with his team and. I mean, Raj Singh is out there. They, they've given Mustafa Ali so many different partners <laughs> at this point. But if they're going to use Champagne Singh for this, I think it works, you know. Uh, but he he ultimately cost Mike Bailey the match. Tom Hannafin was saying that these guys go back, you know, cheese ball Mike Bailey and Trent. I'll have a number seven with a pie. Um, these guys are from two different countries. 
even Tom, Tom even said this. And I'm not saying he's wrong. I don't know these guys. But they're from two different countries. Two different independent scenes. Trent, I'll have a number seven, was with like NXT UK or something like that. Cheeseball Mike Bailey couldn't even leave the country for years. How were these? How did these guys go back? I'm pretty sure they met each other for the fucking first time in TNA. But again, I don't know anything. I'm just a lowly podcaster who podcasts from his fucking dining room. Because I'm the only podcaster with a five bedroom house that has no nowhere to podcast. So I'm in the dining room. I have two dining rooms though, so it's my empty dining room. But still, I'm just a dude from his dining room. Okay, what the fuck do I know? I, I still feel like these guys met for the first time in TNA. The right person won here. Um, of course, then we're going to do it clean because Mike Bailey does not lose clean. You can go to every single Mike Bailey loss on this show, with the exception of his hour and a half match versus Josh Alexander. He does not lose clean to anybody. So, and Trent doesn't beat anybody. So, this was the right way to do it. The right person won because Trent should be wrestling against all odds. And again, these are all throwaway matches. The only one it isn't is the Nemeth Brothers versus the system. Because the Nemeth Brothers might win. Everything else is a throwaway match against all odds, which, which is fine. Which is fine. As I said, it should be something in the middle of good and pointless. And this is in the middle of that. Because the money is in Mike Bailey and Ali. And they, you know, they set that angle up as well in this match. So Trent the seventh wins, and he's going to go on to TNA plus to uh, to challenge for the X division championship. I thought the the main event just I just thought there was too much going on. I thought it was too long. Um, again, when you stop to do the chop spots, you start taking me out of it. There was I mean there was run ins there were multiple run ins. I mean this was just this was just a mess. So this was not a Matt classic, but I can see where someone. Someone liked the match, you know, because both these guys are pretty good. They can wrestle. I'm not the biggest fan necessarily of them, but they're good enough. I think that's going to do it for me this week, folks. Um, what do I got coming up this week here? We so we got double or nothing tonight, and I said, as I said last week, I I just even though I can get into the uh, the event free, I don't think I have the energy. I, I've been to four WMEA games in the last two weeks including one last night, um, triple a baseball game, you know, like I've been to a lot of sporting events as my point. I don't know if I have the energy now at the end of the week to sit through near falls and 25 minute matches. And, you know, I'm tempted to go just because it's free, but I don't think I'm going to. Other than that, I don't know what I got. I'm, I'm hoping this week, there's a little more content on the channel. There's just nothing going on in TNA. There's nothing for me to talk about. I can't even, <clears throat> I can't even make up conversa uh, you know, conversations I have with you guys and things to, things to talk about and, and, and things to create content about. There's just nothing, nothing going on. So we'll see. I'm your boy BQ. Thank for you. Thank you for checking me out. As always, we will talk to you next week. Peace.